Hey folks, welcome to Board Game Casual. I had some friends in town for an epic weekend of board gaming, so I thought it would be fun to rank the eight games I got to play this weekend. This includes some new games, some I'm already well familiar with, and even a two-player game that my girlfriend and I wrapped up the weekend with. Let's get to it! Coming in at number eight also happens to be the first game we played this weekend, and a new one for me, The Genius Square. My friend Andy is obsessed with fun ways to decide who gets to be starting player. He's the same friend who sent me the Go First dice, which I reviewed in a previous video. This time, he brought a couple copies of The Genius Square as another fun way to determine player order in this quick warm-up game. The Genius Square is a little race to solve a Tetris-style puzzle. You first roll some dice, which determines the position of the blockers on your 6x6 grid. Then it's a race to see who can place their Tetris pieces into their grid first. The wooden components are nice and chunky and are very satisfying to place into the raised plastic grid. I'm generally not a big fan of puzzles or polyomino games, but this one's really fast. It plays in minutes, and the stakes are really low. So admittedly, I thought it was pretty fun. Conceptually, I'm also just blown away by the mathematics in this game. In no matter where those blockers end up, you will always be able to place all of your Tetris pieces on your board. I give the Genius Square a 7. Definitely worth checking out. Number seven on the list is Point Salad. I pulled out this little filler game the next morning as my friends were waiting for their ride. I like having this game on my shelf. This is always a good one to pull out when you have a limited amount of free time to play. My friends had never played it before, and I knew I could teach this one easily. It's very lightweight, but it's breezy and fun. The choice you make between either taking the two vegetable cards or the one scoring card is so simple, but it can be crunchy and leads to some good strategizing. What's nice is that this game plays fast and is the easy type of game to play back to back. So you teach someone, they get the hang of it, and it's easy for them to be like, all right, I get it, let's go again. If you're looking for a welcoming, cheap filler game, this is a good one. I give Point Salad a 7.5. I was really excited to get in another play of Earth, which I'm putting in the sixth spot in this list. Now, I already gave a lot of my thoughts on this game and some of the issues I found with it in a previous video, so definitely check that one out if you want to hear a more detailed review. In terms of playing Earth a second time, I will say, as expected, it really helps to be more familiar with the game, the types of cards and dependencies, and more used to the less-than-ideal iconography. Although we still got a couple of other icons crossed this time around. That said, this game has so much flying at you so quickly, it's really hard to absorb everything, and I feel like you just need to grab onto a strategy early on and just do your best to stick with it. Early in the game, I decided I'd go for a composting strategy. I focused on cards that let me compost and draw, and then just got rid of everything else. And hey, that scored me a win. I've still got Earth rated at a 7.5. It's fun, and if you like being able to get stuff and take actions on other people's turns, definitely check this one out. Number five on the list is a new game I've been excited to try out. Green Team Wins. This game was on my top 10 unopened games I'm excited to play in 2024 list. This is a light party game. It's very low stakes, easy to teach, and a game that really leads to fun table conversation. I was definitely alone in thinking that red starbursts are better than the pink ones, for example. It was a perfect little filler in between some of the bigger, heavier games. Green Team Wins is a great game for what it is. It's the perfect game to bring out with non-gamers. It's not too thinky, it's great with family, and it can be played with people of all ages, basically anyone who can write. It's breezy, it's easy to teach and learn, and anyone can play. The other nice thing is, as far as party games go, it doesn't put anyone uncomfortably on the spot. Everyone just writes their answers down at the same time and reveals you count the majority and that's it. 
Yet what this game does that's really clever, especially unlike the Chameleon, is that it has a decent scoring mechanism. So it has a true end game and a true winner. It's a lot of fun. What's really cool about this game is that it plays up to six, but if you want to play in a bigger group, you can just buy additional copies of the game. I have two copies, for example, so we can play with up to 12 people. A third copy would mean playing up to 18, and so on. Overall, I'm giving this game a solid eight, considering the category it falls into. I also got this cheap on Black Friday, and if you can find it on sale, it's a great game to have on your shelf. Number four is another new game I played for the first time, and another game that was on my top 10 unopened games I'm most excited to play in 2024 list, Wingspan Asia. We actually had a power outage on Sunday after my friends left. So what better excuse for my girlfriend and I than to keep the board game party going with this fun little two-player version of Wingspan. Now while this game can be used as an expansion to the base game, it itself is also a totally standalone two-player game, which makes it pretty unique. It gives you all the things you need. Bird cards, egg tokens, dice, and player boards that include some new artwork, but all in sort of a slimmed down package. More importantly, it comes with this new module for the two-player game, where you get to place a token on this new board every time you play a bird card, which I thought really added to the game. It puts a bigger emphasis on getting bird cards out. And of course, a big part of the fun in Wingspan is going through all the wonderful bird cards. It also helps negate the infamous egg laying strategy of the original game, giving you a lot more alternatives to scoring and strategy. I found myself playing a lot of birds in the water habitat, which was fun because traditionally that's the habitat I focused on the least in the original game. Overall, I give Wingspan Asia a nine. Obviously, you don't get some of the nicer pieces that are in the normal game, like the bird feeder and the multiple colors of eggs, but at two players, without a doubt, I prefer Wingspan Asia over base Wingspan. Number three on the list is a classic favorite of mine, Century Gollum Edition. I brought this out towards the end of the night when I wanted something a little lighter to teach as my friends had never played this one before either. And it just reminded me how much I like this game. This game flows so well. It's full of great choices and opportunities to strategize, but it moves along at such a great pace. The game just sings. The card and component production is fantastic. A perfect example of chunky jewels, complete with their own organizer trays, and metal coins done right. I love card markets like this, where you're dropping jewels on the cards you don't want to get the one you do. And eventually so many jewels pile up on a card, it becomes too good not to take it. Such a great mechanism. This is another pretty fast one. We played two games back to back, and I had a lot of fun in one of our plays where I played a three card deck the entire time. I even was the first to trigger the end game, but lost by just a hair on points. Century Golem is a fantastic, elegant game. It still holds up after all these years. I give it a solid 10. If somehow you haven't played it, go give it a try. Now my number one and my number two on this list are interchangeable. I love both of these games and it was hard to pick which one I liked better this weekend. But I had to make a choice and so number two is Champions of Midgard with the Valhalla expansion. For the sole reason that when teaching it, I had to keep jumping back and forth between the main rulebook and the rulebook for the expansion, which is always kind of annoying. The Valhalla expansion was yet another one of the top 10 unopened games I was most excited to play in 2024. And for those curious, this means in the first two months of this year, I've already knocked six of those games off the list, including the honorable mention. Champions of Midgard was already one of my favorite games. It was in my top 10 new-to-me games of 2023. 
And I definitely agree with the sentiment on how much better the expansion makes the game. This is a must have for me now, and I can't imagine playing the game without it. The biggest change Valhalla introduces is that now if you lose a dice in combat, you receive a Valhalla token for that warrior. And those tokens can eventually be turned in as a free action for additional benefits or even additional warriors. As someone who's typically risk averse, now I'm okay with losing a warrior. In fact, I might purposely want to lose a warrior because I need that token for something I'm building towards. With this expansion, you actually have the option to ignore any defense that you roll. The other cool thing is you can choose which warrior to lose and therefore which token you get, furthering the agency and the strategy in this game. As an example, I was having a tough time getting to the ships and fighting the monsters since since everyone else was going there. And instead, I got a Valhalla card that gave me a point multiplier for defeated Draugr cards. So I got to focus my energy on fighting low-level Draugrs instead. The new leaderboards and leader dice are fun as well, adding some new bonus actions in the game. Although it also adds more to keep track of. I think all of us kept forgetting about our additional bonus skills. I chalk it up to the learning experience. This was two of my friends' first time playing Champions of Midgard, and they couldn't even comprehend how the game would work without the expansion, so I think that says a lot. I give the Valhalla expansion a 9.5, docking it slightly simply because I wish the tokens were chunkier. I know I'm late to the game on this one, but if you're just getting into Champions of Midgard and don't have the Valhalla expansion, I highly, highly recommend it. And the number one game I played this weekend continues to be one of my favorite games of all time, Lost Ruins of Arnak. This game is so much fun and just speaks to me. My two buddies had never played this game either. Lost Ruins of Arnak was the game they were most excited to try coming into the weekend, and this was by far their favorite game that we played. One of my buddies actually ordered a copy while we were playing the game because he liked it so much. Lost Ruins of Arnak is a fun game of deck building, tableau building, worker placement, exploration, and action selection. At first glance, it can look like there's a lot going on, but honestly, once you start playing, it's pretty straightforward. The game plays at a pretty good pace and has a good feeling of progression. There's a lot of opportunity to strategize on which actions you want to take and when, and I love those moments where you buy a card or get a reward or can do things in a clever way that let you squeeze out one more action. Now, I was very close to pulling out the Expedition Leaders expansion as well, since I haven't gotten a chance to play it with the expansion. In fact, I also have the Missing Expedition expansion sitting on my shelf too. But since I was teaching the game for the first time to people who had never played before, much less never played a deck building game, I figured it would be better to start with the basics. The leader character boards and the asymmetry felt a little too complex to learn myself while teaching it at the same time. Now honestly, I'm most interested in the new research track, just for more variation. So one thing I was tempted to try was to use the new research track, maybe the cards and the components, but without using the leaders. I just wasn't sure if this would work or if this would break the game. Maybe someone in the comments can let me know if you can use the research track from the expansion without the other stuff, and if I should or shouldn't mix in the cards and components if I did that. Since I wasn't sure, we just played the base game. Here's something that stood out to me in this play, which is a testament to the game. Pretty early on as I was getting into Arnak, I realized that focusing on the research track seemed to be the best strategy for victory. It seemed like this was the key to winning the game. Well, this time around, since I had a couple of friends playing for the first time, I wouldn't say I was purposely taking it easy on them, but I thought, why not try something else and some other strategies? My buddies on their own intuitively started racing up the research track and getting a bunch of those point tiles at the top. I did enough of the research track to get two assistants and maybe even turning one of them to the gold side. But I instead focused a lot more on discovering sites and fighting monsters and I ended up winning the game. So it just goes to show how balanced this game is in terms of paths to victory. 
I love this game. It's a 10 in my book, and I highly recommend giving it a try if you haven't. Lost Ruins of Arnak. So there you have it, my ranking of the eight games I played in an epic weekend of gaming. The game I liked most was Lost Ruins of Arnak, but in second place, just by a hair, Champions of Midgard with the Valhalla expansion. Number three is a classic Century Golem edition. Number four, Wingspan Asia as a two-player game. Five, Green Team wins, followed by Earth at number six, Point Salad at number seven, and The Genius Square at number eight. If you've played any of these games, I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments, and especially if you have any more insights to the Expedition Leaders expansion to Lost Ruins of Arnak. Thank you so much for watching, for liking and subscribing, and I'll see you next time here on Board Game Casual.